Hello, and happy Thanksgiving, early. So today, I'm going to continue our fascinating trip through the history of England. And today we're going to talk about the tyrant of England. One of the many tyrants of England, but the tyrant of England. Now last time I discussed about how the second phrase of the Hundred Years' War went, which gave Edward III everything he wanted, except the throne of France. But because England chose to play the long game, they ended up losing nearly everything they won when King John II of France died. And I talked about how the House of Commons rose up, refused to pay taxes, new taxes, unless they were listened to, and then how uh, they were meeting the heir to the throne, and the Black Prince died, and followed shortly afterwards by his father, Edward III. We went on a fascinating trip about the English Church and the shift they dealt with under John Rycliffe and the Lullard movement. Shifts that we reported later on when the Reformation came calling under Edward VIII. I then turned back and talked about the beginning rule of King Richard II and the Peasants' Rebellion of 1381. So today, I plan to look at the rest, or most of the rest of the reign of Richard II, and examine how he became a tyrant, which will lead, next time, to the rise of the Lancaster family, a cadet branch of the Plantagenet dynasty. Now, the consequence of the rebellion was unease and even a bit of dread. Many throughout England feared that another revolt would happen, and they prepared themselves for it, although this is the only revolt of its kind in English history. Now, there were other revolts, but it's the only kind led really kind of by the peasants. But they did not know that then. For more than 200 years, authorities feared lo local rebellion for revolt of the masses could trigger disaster for the state. And there were sporadic revolts out of 1381, usually red strikes against oppressive landlords, and because of this fear, there were attempts to appease and accommodate the demands of the peasants. For instance, for the rest of the medieval period, there was never again another poll tax. And slowly, serfdom was abolished in England, and the rising prosperity of those in work created a sense of freedom that was traced back to be a result of the revolt, and that encouraged a greater relaxation of the old feudal order. Now, over the next generation, living standards of the agricultural workers improved. Real wages grew, despite attempts in Parliament to keep this from happening. And life expectancy rose, and clothing became brighter and more luxurious, with jewelry becoming more evident. Now, Richard II had undergone and come through successfully a test of fire. He confronted and defeated the first and last popular rebellion in English history. His later behavior suggested his belief in himself and an essential div divinity of kingship was redoubled. At the age of 15, he was now a king whose presence alone was enough to command large crowds to obey his will. He was six feet high, had blonde hair, and a somewhat feminine face. His nostrils were flared. He had prominent cheekbones, heavy eyelids. He looked like a king in all respects, many said. But his manner was abrupt. He stammered when he was decided, and he flushed easily. His temper was uneven. He was always quick to assert his royal dignity. And like all the Tagines, his anger was terrible. Once he drew a sword on Archbishop of Canterbury and would have killed the man if he had not been restrained. He was extravagant in dress, frightened of war, preferred to spend the night drinking and spending time with friends. In 1383, he declared his minority was over. The year before, he married Anne of Bohemia, the daughter of Carl IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, and both were the same age. Remarkably. Now, bolstered by formal liberal um, in-laws and by his own assumption of power, he felt able to choose those he wanted to advise him. But in doing so, he refused to allow John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, or Thomas of Woodstock, Woodstock Duke of Gloucester, both of whom were his uncles, to advise him. Both men are angry at this, and both left the court protesting against his evil advisors. Now, Richard may have feared both men. They both were in line to the throne, after all. If he didn't have any children, it would go to first John of Gaunt, and if John of Gaunt didn't have any children, well, it would go to Thomas of Woodstock. Now, John of Gaunt had one legitimate son, Henry. He had three daughters and four bastard children. Thomas had a son named Humphrey and three daughters. Both men, remember, were younger sons of the late King Edward III. Richard II was a man lavish in granting lands and castles and titles, and he borrowed a lot of money, even once giving 
the crown as security. The old lords out of favor and denied gifts were therefore restless. Again, it's the old story told many times before, and again the court was a dangerous place to be. In the spring of 1383, Richard decided to seize Flanders from France, but the whole campaign was botched. The campaign was led by Henry de Spencer, the Bishop of Norwich, but he was not a good commander, and after massacring a town of instant Flemish citizens, he managed to get his army surrounded and then agreed to a truce to get out of it. Now, there are hints that if he had done something, Richard had planned to use a campaign to evade France proper. But because of the campaign and the prospect that if he did this, it would cause high taxes and another possible bolt, he backed off. In the summer of 1385, Richard II heard that France and England were planning to invade North England, so he called a feudal summons, the last time this was done in England. And after combining the army of at Newcastle, marched north, burning Melrose Abbey and other religious houses on his way to Edinburgh. There, however, he found that the Scots had fled, and the Scottish soldiers were moving on him from the Highlands. But instead of marching to meet them, Richard refused. He used the excuse that he did not have the supplies to do so. So he went back home. This does not approve his reputation of being a brave man in battle. Remember, in the medieval time, the king had to be brave in battle. He had been given the opportunity to display himself as a sovereign in war, but success had eluded him twice. And this is the last time he would lead forces against France or Scotland. There were no battles, no sieges, no towns, no castles conquered under Richard II. But that's okay, because Hugh's treasury was bankrupt. In the summer of 1386, rumors arrived that the French were planning to invade England. So Richard ordered the people of Rye, Sandwich, and Dover to stay in the towns. He made stronger castles on the southern coast, and he ordered the citizens of London to stockpile enough food to withstand the siege of three months. He also began to plan an invasion of France. But the House of Commons refused to grant him the money to do this, and the threat of invasion faded away by winter because the French court was pretty much in the same boat as Richard. No money for war. Now, as I stated, Parliament met in October 1386 in Westminster Hall, as had been come custom, but this time, Richard II prepared a surprise. When the Parliament arrived, the stat they found the statues of previous kings, large in the life, adorning the hall, every king from every confessor to Richard II looking down at the proceedings. Now, this was meant to show that Richard thought the kings overlooked the lower subjects of the realm, and therefore were all powerful and should be respected. But this did not work out like he wanted. The House of Lords approved several petitions to be sent to Richard, all designed to curb his abuse of power. They accused him of going around the law. They accused him of ignoring the advice of the proper counselors. They accused him of appointing and rewarding unsuitable advisors and giving out land offices without advice, as well as handing out parties for rape and murder just to raise money for the crown. Now, Richard had refused to come to Westminster, so a a group of deputies visited the king at the palace of Eltham and demanded he remove the chancellor, Michael de la Pole, one of the new men whom Richard favored at the expense of the old nobility. Richard raged against the man from the Lords and Commons and accused them of being disloyal and, and committing treason. He said he would not fire a servant from his kitchen, even if Parliament demanded it of him, nor would anyone else be dismissed. So rumors began to spread that Richard was planning to arrest and behead the leading nobles. So Thomas of Woodstock stepped up and came to see Richard at Eltham. With him came Richard V. Allen, Earl Ardenale, very powerful, very skilled. And these two nobles informed Richard that he was ruling England unwisely and unlawfully, and they said the country had always been ruled by a concord between kings and lords, which was a lie, but... They did enforce their claim with a barely disguised threat that, just like his great-grandfather Edward II, Richard could be deposed and murdered. And with no child of his own, Thomas was in line to take the throne, and helping get rid of Richard would probably hand him that crown. So Richard decided that since he was only 21 years old, he had to make peace with his enemies because he could not be totally sure of himself, and he could not afford to antagonize them and go the way of his ancestor. Now, he respected Edward II, and he would try to argue later on with the church that Richard, Edward II should be made a saint. It didn't work. But anyway, 
So Richard gave in to the demands and agreed to come to Westminster, and there he agreed his household could be investigated and administered by a commission of bishops and nobles. And because of this, Michael the Lepole was fired and thrown into prison, and Thomas Arndale, Bishop of Lai, took his place as chancellor. Now I must state that a parliament could be seen as doing good in this session of 1386. They shouldn't be praised. They were not good people fighting against a tyrant. They were people who had their own interests that just happened to clash with Richard at that moment in time. Some were known to be taking bribes to vote certain ways. Others were taking bribes to shut up unless ordered to speak. Some stumbled and mumbled when they spoke. Others slept through the whole sessions that they were attending. And the king chafed under the restrictions imposed by this wonderful parliament, as it came to be known. The commission was given power for a year, and Richard decided to play a waiting game and muster his resources. So he met the aldermen of London and the sheriffs of the various counties, but none of these men agreed to back him because of what he had done in the past. So he then met with the judges of the land in the summer of 1387, and they ruled that Richard could change or dismiss the ordinances of Parliament at his will, which effectively annulled the power of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. The judges also declared that those who tried to curb the power of Richard would be considered traitors, even if they were not technically guilty of that crime. Now that point meant that Richard, if he wanted, could have his lords arrested and beheaded without a fair trial and have the land seized. So throughout that fall, a tense confrontation was continued. The lords refused to meet Richard after he summoned them. The Earl of Northumberland agreed to act as a mediator, but soon became clear that compromise could not and would not happen. So in November, the lords decided to fight and called upon the household forces. On December 20th, 1387, at Radcot Bridge near the Thames, they defeated an army loyal to Richard and then marched on London while Richard was hiding in the tower. Now, it seems that for three days Richard was deposed and he has power stripped from him, but there was no clear agreement who would be the new king. Could it be John the Gaunt? Could it be John Gaunt's son? Could it be Thomas? Could it be Humphrey? Could it be someone else? And so it was decided that Richard could be king again after he agreed to submit to the demands. And so the lords demanded that Richard give them control over his household, and then went around firing his various household servants and having them arrested. The lords then summoned what became known as the Merciless Parliament to meet on February 3rd, 1388, and the main point would be to deal with their enemies. The first victims were the judges who denounced them as traitors. The Chief Justice of the King's Bench, Robert Tressoland, was tried and sentenced to be executed. His colleagues were then sent into exile in Ireland. Now, Tressoland managed to flee from sanctuary in Westminster Abbey, but he was then dragged out by a mob and taken to Tyburn Cross, where he was hanged and had his throat cut. But his new regime of the Lords was not marked by great success. The Commons had hoped that by removing the evil councillors from the King, the realm would become richer. richer and be administered fairly. But the lords were divided. They had their own interest. And the finances of England did not get better since they could not agree on who would lead the invasion. Rule by committee is not He offered to act as mediator between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And he offered to, re to re retrain restrain his own use of retainers and sweetly asked that the Lords do the same. Now his was a policy of divide and conquer, so in the spring of 1389 the King declared he was once again assuming full responsibility for the affairs of England. Now there's a little debate since Richard pointed out that for 12 years he and his kingdom had been ruled by others, and the result was that people had been burdened by excessive taxes, and that they had done nothing to help England, so now he's 22 years old, and he's going to rule alone. Richard had been threatened and almost destroyed in 1388, but now he was king, and he let this be known to everyone. He was the source of all justice and all order in England in both the House of Lords and House of Commons. They had to get used to the idea. They're his subjects, not his master. And he now made his household three times as large as before, almost as large as the household of Henry I. 
when he was king had once helped. In the fall of 1390, he gathered around himself a body of followers and put on them a badge of a white heart. The court now became a place of splendor where Richard would sit upon his throne watching everyone and talking to no one. Richard made clear to everyone that, not, that the only one he, who he bowed to was God himself. And he started to visit the shrines of saints and began new cults as well as read about miracles. He became the patron of the Carthinians and lavished treasures on them to rebuild their churches and abbeys. But triumph soon became tyranny. And in the summer of 1397, Richard invited the Earl of Warwick to dinner and then when, sup when supper was over, he had him arrested. Now when he heard the news of this, the Earl of Arndale surrendered. And the king then rode to the home of his uncle, Thomas of Woodstock, and woke him up, and then had him as rest arrested as well. Richard then issued a decree that those three men had been targeted as they were planning to pose him, something that historians have doubt was actually happening, and instead they believe he was simply paying back old wounds. So Richard then called a parliament, which was terrified and therefore therefore submissive to his every well whim. Now Richard only attended the sessions with guards surrounding him. The building itself would always be surrounded by archers when he was in attendance. Richard was a line that force would allow him his sway. So Richard then announced that one out of the kindness of his heart and his love for his people, he is issuing a general pardon to everyone but fifty people, who he would not name which, of course, kept everyone in suspense since he simply stated later on that such and such a person was one of these 50. Kind of like, oh, McCarthy. You know, I have a list of 400 communists here, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. Anyway, he also gratefully accepted, Richard II, not Henry, not McCarthy, um, the gift of the House of Commons of duties leveraged, levied on leather and wool for the foreseeable future. Now, meanwhile, Thomas of Woodstock had been taken to Calais, and there he was quietly strangled to death. The Earl, Earl Arundel was given a show trial, persuaded, persuaded over by John of Gaunt, and found guilty, taken to Tower Hill, and beheaded. The Earl Warwick was banished for life to the Isle of Man. All the lands of these three men were seized and given to the king's friends and supporters. Now, even though his enemies, enemies had been scattered, Richard was depressed. His wife, Anne of Bohemia, had died in 1394 from plague, and they had been married for 12 years, but had produced no children. Richard ordered the palace of Sheen raised to the ground, because this is where he had once been happiest. And it seems likely that Richard was ill, since the royal accounts show large sums of money being paid to doctors. We don't know what he was ill with, he could have been just been depressed, but something was going on. Now, many of the lords were terrified at Richard now. At the snap of his finger, and yes, I can't snap, but at the snap of his finger, he could have him arrested and thrown into prison, have the land seized, handed anyone he wished. He would levy large fines in towns and shires that supported his enemies and would have to pay these fines, and he'd also demand loans from the richest of the, mon richest of the monasteries and abbeys. No one could see him now, and he is always guarded by those archers. Now, in late 1397, his fate began to unravel. It was due to a quarrel between Thomas Mowbray, of the Duke of Norfolk, and Henry Bolingbroke, the Duke of Her Hereford. Henry Bolingbroke was his cousin. Now, both men supported the king in his fight against the so-called rebel lords, and both have been amply awarded for this. But in a conversation between Mowbray and Bolingbroke, Mowbray suggested that Bolingbroke could be murdered if the king wished, since he was untrustworthy. So Henry went to his father, John de Gaunt, and reported this conversation. And John de Gaunt then went to his nephew, King Richard II, and reported the conversation. Richard called Henry to him, demanded he tell him what the conversation had been about, and then demanded he repeat it in front of Parliament. Now at this point, Mowbray turned himself in, and he denied everything. So both Bolingbroke and Mowbray were ordered to appear in front of the Committee of Parliament, which is set up to judge the matter. But the committee divided on the verdict. Instead, demanded that both men fight a duel, in which God would give victory upon the one telling the truth, but which was really telling the truth. It's possible that Bolingbroke had been the one who said everything, and realizing he had talked too much, he then went to his father and then the king to keep Mowbray from turning him in. 
It's also possible that Mowbray had said what he did, hoping that Bolingbroke would agree and that Mowbray would be able to accuse him of treason. But we'll never know the truth. Anyway, on September 16th, 1398, the two men met in Coventry on Gosford Green. All the lords were there to see this duel, for this was the battle of the century. The two men arrived, they swore they were an innocent party, and they prepared the duel to the death. As they charged toward each other, the king called a halt to the proceedings. And then two hours later, the Speaker of the House of Commons announced that Bolingbroke was banished from England for ten years. And Mulberry was banished from England for life. Now in retrospect, Richard had little choice in this matter. If Mulberry had won, it would cause his enemies to demand that the murderer Thomas Woodstock, who Mulberry had been ordered um, to murder, that it would be investigated. If Bolingbroke had won, this would cause people to know that Henry was the heir to the throne, since Richard had no children, and that Henry should be named as heir to the throne, or maybe even depose Richard and take the throne himself. Now, Richard had recently married, again, to Isabella of Valois, the daughter of King Charles VI of France. And though she was only seven years old, it was hoped that one day she would give Richard children. So, Bolingbroke and Mowbray went into exile. Mowbray went to Venice, where he died in 1399. But for Henry Bolingbroke, the story was only beginning. He sailed for France, and there Charles VI granted him a home in Paris. Five months later, he heard that his father, John of Gaunt, had died, and therefore he was the new Duke of Lancaster, with huge amounts of land around the north of England and 30 castles. But since he was in exile, Richard announced that the lands were legally his, and that Henry was now banished for life. Now such interference in the laws and inheritance shocked many in that society, and now no landlord or land, landowner could feel safe for any king who unlawfully deprived his subjects of their property in the fines of the Magna Carta was a tyrant. So what was going to happen now? Would Richard II stay safe on his throne and produce many more Plantagenet children to succeed him? Or would Henry come back to England and take the throne away? Now for anyone who's read Shakespeare, I think we know how the story ends, so I'm going to give it away. Richard loses. But how truthful was the propagandist R William Shakespeare? Join me next time and find out the continuing story, the history of England.